Hey everybody, um, I just wanted to share some scripture verses here that I've had for a while. Uh, this is really good for people who maybe you're in the church, being led astray, people just coming to the faith, or people that just have questions. So I've got this kind of article form here, I'm just going to read through it. Um, and I hope this uh, blesses someone. Praise Yah for this. Um, everything is for his will, right? And uh, all glory to God. Um, so everybody, please take some time to read and study your Bible. Our Father has given us some of his wisdom in his scriptures. We must search out the truth and seek him with all we are. And he will remove the veil over our eyes so we can see clearly what he is showing us. I pray that you read these scriptures and explanations and you read them in context, if, which is the full chapter, the full book, right? Not just the, the verse or two. To get a true understanding of what the Father is telling us. He lets us know his heart what he likes and what he dislikes. We should only care about what things mean to him, not what they mean to us. We should do what he asks the way he desires and not do the things he asks us not to do. May you be blessed by his word. So the first item on here is, did any of the Old Testament rules and commands go away when Yeshua died? Matthew five seventeen. Through 19. This is from the CJB. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah, which is God's law, or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yet or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvot, which are commands, and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now what this doesn't say is that I did not come to destroy the law. I came to do away with it. Like that just that's just double negative. He came to give it full meaning and show us all how it should be done. He gave it a deeper meaning and he, he led by example. This tells us that the law, which is the Ten Commandments, will not change in any way until heaven and earth pass away. Neither heaven nor earth have passed away, so the law is still in full effect. The, this wasn't meaning until he died. Because when he died, heaven and earth didn't pass away. I've heard people say that before. He had to complete everything. Everything's not complete. Read your Bible, there's prophecy. The things in there are not complete. He hasn't come back down. New Jerusalem has definitely not come down to earth. Romans 3, 27, 31. The CJB version. So what room is left for boasting? None at all. What kind of Torah excludes it? One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules? No, rather a Torah that has to do with trusting. Therefore, we hold the view that a person comes to be considered righteous by God on the ground of trusting, which has nothing to do with legalistic observance of Torah commands. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles, because as you will admit, God is one. Therefore, he will consider righteous the circumcised on the ground of trusting and the uncircumcised through the same trusting. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we confirm Torah. Right. Legalistic observance or the rules is literally reading the list of rules and following them with no conviction behind it with no desire to do them, you just do them because they are there. God does not want you to follow the commands that way. His desire is for us to want to follow and obey his commands. We trust that God will protect us and provide us with all the promised blessings 
when we desire to follow his commands. It's not a one-sided relationship. All right. Defining righteousness. Deuteronomy 6.25. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to obey these commands before Adonai our God, just as he ordered us to. 1 Corinthians 6.9. Don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? So these two scriptures that, that I just read show us that to be righteous is to follow God's commands. And to sin, or to be unrighteous to the same thing, is to not follow the commands. There are several more that back this up. You can look into these by doing a Bible study on righteousness. The definition of truth. 1 John 2, 4. Anyone who says, I know him, but isn't obeying his commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. This is telling us that the truth is knowing the commands. Someone who does not obey the commands does not have the truth. Psalm 119, verse 116. The main thing about your word is that it's true, and all your just rulings last forever. Right? Truth. Right there. The word is the truth. Psalm 86, 11. Adonai, teach me your way so that I can live by your truth. Your truth is your word, your commands. Make me single-hearted so that I can fear your name. Buy the truth, don't sell it. Also wisdom, discipline, and discernment. It's Proverbs 23, 23. Psalm 119, verse 142, your righteousness is eternal righteousness and your command, your Torah, is truth. All these scriptures above are clear that God's word is the truth spoken about all through the Bible. We should desire to live by his truth. This is a really good one. Um, people observing Sunday as the day of the Lord. Should we keep the Sabbath? on Saturday. Just right, the day that God said to do it. Seventh day. Exodus twenty verse eight. Remember the day, Shabbat, to set it apart for God. Deuteronomy five twelve. Observe the day of Shabbat to set it apart as holy, as Adonai your God ordered you to do. He literally ordered them, his people, to keep the Sabbath. Do you consider yourself one of his people? I do. The Bible tells me I'm grafted in. I believe it. Isaiah 66, 23. Every month on Rosh Hodesh, which is um, a new moon, new month, first of the month, and every week on Shabbat, everyone living will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai. So Isaiah is prophesying everyone will worship on Sabbath. So if you love God the Father, you should not exclude yourself in this prophecy. We're going to be doing the Sabbath in heaven on the day he told us to do it. You going to do it now? Yeah, you should. Ezekiel 28.8 You treat my holy things with contempt. You profane my Sabbaths. He doesn't like it when we do that, when we don't observe them. We can't profane the Sabbath. Keep it holy. It's the fourth commandment. Mark 6, 2. On Sabbath, he started to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They asked, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom he has been given? What are these miracles work through him? Yep, Yeshua kept the Sabbath. Acts 17, 2. According to his usual practice, Saul, Paul, Shaul, went in and on three Sabbaths, he gave them drashes from the Tanakh. Paul kept the Sabbath, actually over 80 times in the book of Acts, if you do the math. Hebrews 4, 9. So there remains a Sabbath keeping for God's people. Uh, right there, guys, there remains a Sabbath keeping for God's people. 
The Sabbath is for God's people and should never be changed. There was no, the church had no right to change the Sabbath day. It was ordained at the time of creation for all time. No one should ever think they can overdo what God has done. Never. You know, how do we love God? How do we how do we show we love him? What do we do to love him? Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be a front, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. You love your Lord, your God, with everything you have. All the time. 1 John verse, chapter 5, verse 3. For loving God means obeying his commands. Pretty simple. Moreover, his commands are not burdensome. Right? His commands, this is equal in the Ten Commandments here. And to love God is to keep them. I mean, that's straightforward as many other verses as well that you can find that will back that up. Who's God going to bless and protect? Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. From this you can know that Adonai, your God, is indeed God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and extends grace to those who love him and observe his commands. We just read that to love him is to obey him. To a thousand generation. His covenants are blessings. Those who love him and observe his commands will be blessed down to the thousandth generation. That's like forever. 80 years per generation, thousand generations. He's saying they'll be blessed. Always. Daniel 9.4 I prayed to Adonai my God and made this confession. Please Adonai, great and fearsome God who keeps his covenant and extends grace to those who love him and observe his mitzvot. That's who, those who love him and observes his commands. Nehemiah 1, verse 5. I said, please, Adonai, God of heaven, you great and fearsome God who keeps his covenant and extends grace to those who love him and observe his mitzvot. Wow, completely repeated again three times right there. Three different books. Hebrews 1, verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy in presence of your companions. As we know already, righteousness equals following God's commands. So loving his commands and hating wickedness, he, he gets joy out of that, right? We get joy, he gets joy. Hmm. He blesses us. James 1 verse 9. How blessed is the man who preserves through temptation. Right? Doesn't fall for it, doesn't fall into it. For after he has passed the test, he will receive as his crown the life which God has promised to those who love him. Temptation is sin. For those who don't sin, God will give life, everlasting life in heaven for those who love him. All these verses show that all who love him which goes hand in hand with keeping his commandments, as we've seen in these verses, will be blessed and loved by God now and in the kingdom of heaven. Very, very important. Don't let anyone tell you anything about the commands other than it shows God we love him. And it's his desire for us to obey them and obey him. So what does the Bible say about teaching anything different from what God has commanded? Right? Like the commands are gone and you don't have to do them. Romans 16 verse 17. I 
I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. During the time of the New Testament, the only scriptures that existed is what we call the Old Testament, right? So the doctrine this verse is referring to are the commands in the Old Testament and all the teachings in it. We're to stay away from those who do anything contrary to the commands. Say anything or teach anything different. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to different to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are on, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I'll say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be cursed. Again, the only scriptures at this time are what we call the Old Testament. This is saying that anyone teaching something different than what is the Old Testament is cursed. Look at this, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Watch Yeshua. Look what he does. He lives his life by the commands. He never sinned. He was fully obedient. That's what he preached. So, how did how did Yeshua say that we could obtain eternal life? Because the church just says, you know, tithe, be good people, believe in believe in God. Let's see what the scriptures say. Matthew nineteen seventeen. Why are you asking me about good? There is one who is good. But if you want to obtain eternal life, observe the commands. You should, out of his own mouth, in the red letters, he said to obtain eternal life, eternal life, we must obey the commands. Yes, this includes the Saturday Sabbath and no graven images. Can't be bowing down to statues of Mary. Can't. This Christmas biblical. I don't have any verses for this. Because no. Christmas isn't in the Bible. Therefore, it is not biblical. Moreover, it is common knowledge that Yeshua was not born on December 25th. Just do a quick Google search or YouTube search for Pat Robertson. Christmas. Um, someone calls in with a question saying, my friends say Christmas is pagan. What am I supposed to do? And he says, your friend's right. Christmas is pagan. He goes on to explain it better than I could on how Christianity took Christmas from the pagans, but then Christianized it, which you, the Bible teaches you, you cannot take defilement and unholy things and make them holy or bring them near anything holy because it will defile the holiness. So, uh, can't happen here. The church itself has gone on record several times stating December 25th was the birthday of an existing pagan god, and the church borrowed the day and slapped Jesus' name to it in an attempt to bring more followers to the church. This is, again, Google search. You can find it. Most Catholic church websites, well, not most of their websites, but most of the information you will find is from Catholic church websites talking about this. They, they, they have no shame in explaining where it came from. They thought, the thought was, it's a day the pagans are already celebrating, so they can come and celebrate here and, and, and worship Jesus instead. Okay, but one question. So once you know that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, what's the point of celebrating this day? What's, what's left? Why would you continue to do it? It's kind of pointless, right? You find out that's really not what it's about, not not what it's for, but you're going to do it anyway? I mean, I'm nobody. And uh, I think that 
if I lied and said my birthday was on a certain day and my family celebrated it and they found out I was lying about it and it was right, you know, they found out my right birthday. They're not going to keep celebrating a fake one. And people don't do that. Where would you do that? Ask yourself that question. Maybe as a gag. Funny, right? Um, but no, there's no point except to worship pagan gods. It's a trick, guys. Followers of God are not supposed to follow lies. All the above scriptures make that clear. And that's another part. One of the commandments is do not lie. Telling people that his birthday is December 25th and not is, is wrong right off the bat. They, they aren't forthcoming with the fact of telling you that it's not his real birthday, yet they know it's not his real birthday. It's deception. Does God care if I celebrate Christmas? Because you know why? It's just a nice day with my family. Those are words out of my own mouth, by the way. So, you know, I'm not, I'm in all this stuff here. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. These literally are words out of my own mouth. Uh, since Christmas isn't biblical and is not Yeshua's birthday, that makes Christmas nothing more than a pagan holiday the church has adopted. One of the commandments is to not lie. How can anyone justify then making up stories about Santa and elves to their children? The commandments do not say it's good to lie if it's cute. Nope. The Bible teaches a lie is a lie, and we should listen to the Bible, not the opinion of men. God hates when we mix pagan worship to worship him. Below are several verses to show God's feelings about mixing. And his feelings are the only feelings we should care about. Exodus thirty four fourteen, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Deuteronomy eight nineteen, Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. You, I'll testify and say that you're dead, that you'll die. Right? And I don't think that he's talking about this life. I think he's talking about the second death, guys. We're all going to die. He doesn't have to tell us that we'll surely perish. One out of one dies. He's talking about the second death. Deuteronomy 12, verses 3 through 5. And you shall destroy their altars break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. This, these verses are clear. Even if the worship's directed towards the Lord, if you're doing it in a way the pagans did or with anything the pagans used, he doesn't want you to do it. It's, a com it's an order. It's a command. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Did pagans use Christmas trees as worship? Yeah, they did. They even put silver and gold balls on them. Look up what that represents. It's male genitalia for a guy named Nimrod. He has many names. I mean, this, this is clear. Church... How, how, how do you read this verse and justify yourself? Deuteronomy 29, verse 25 through 27. Then people would say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods they, had, they did not know and that he had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And there's a lot of curses in Deuteronomy. Why would we do this? Why would humans stray this way when we have this knowledge? They've been deceived by the evil spirits into thinking it's okay. Just as the devil was trying to deceive Yeshua in the desert when he was out there for 40 days. Right? He was trying to use scripture to deceive him. 
twist it just a little bit, but Yeshua used scripture to get back at him. That's why it's very important to know your Bible. You can't, how are you going to, how are you going to, or any of us going to be able to spot lies being told to us when scripture is twisted? If we don't know scripture, you can't, I couldn't, you couldn't, you, you, you only notice it when you start to read. Matthew 5, uh, sorry, 15, 9. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And, and it's in vain. You're on Christmas and you're doing your thing and you're saying, but Christ back in Christmas, and it's in vain, guys. He's not there. He's got no part of it. None. Ephesians 4, 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's all it is. Trickery of men, cunning craftiness, and deceitful plotting. We should be firm in our faith, firm in the word, and not be tossed around like little kids. Luke sixteen fifteen, And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. An abomination. You do a word search on abomination in the Bible and see what group that puts you in. It's not good. And they're justifying themselves. We Christianized it. Listen to that Pat Robertson video. Literally justifying it. it says how pagan it is, all this, and then justifies it. We Christianized it. You can't do it. It's an abomination. Jeremiah 25, verse 6. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. And do not, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands. And I will not harm you. He will if you do. Jeremiah 10, verses 3 through 5. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest... The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold, then fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They fasten it to two other pieces of wood laying in an axe, and they decorate it with silver and gold. Sound familiar? I shouldn't have to really even talk about that one. Right? The scriptures are clear if we read them and we understand them in their context and in their meaning. The Bible proves the Bible. If you read something and it seems to contradict everything that you've seen in the Bible, it's most likely you're misunderstanding it. Because God's not going to say, don't do this, it's bad, one verse, and then all of a sudden in the next verse, say, do this, it's good. You're, you're thinking he's saying that. You, you've got to pray for the truth. And you'll see that it all lines up. God is very kind to those who seek him with a pure heart. I've seen it, I don't know how many times. In the end, it's not the thought that counts, but what things mean to us. It comes down to did we do what God wanted the way he wanted it done? He's the only one that counts. You will not find one verse in the entire Bible that gives man the right to change anything God has commanded. And he says multiple times, I, everything I do, I let you know first so that you'll know I did it. And your little gods that you create can't take any credit for it the book of isaiah he says it a bunch of times it's all over the bible he has prophets pronounce what will happen in the future for the purpose of when it happens no one can take credit for it because god's the one who said it was going to happen you don't read in there that he's going to give men the ability to change his stuff no what you read is he he tells us men will change his thing, his days, in vain, and to look out for it and stay away from them. 
That's what he tells us. If any man thinks he can create a holy day better, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if any man thinks that he can create a holy day better than one God created, and the Sabbath changed to Sunday as an example, you should run away from that man because the future, because the future holds certain doom for that person and anyone associated with them. The Bible backs this up. There are examples of men trying to change or twist what God has ordained, and all of them are destroyed or punished. His ways are perfect. And anyone trying to change anything he has set in place is saying God was not right and they know better. This is impossible as he is God alone. Where is the faith in a man that tries to change anything God has proclaimed? What God has given us is enough. We should not seek anything other than what he has given us. We should follow his ways above any other ways or anything or any of the traditions of men. Everyone should ask themselves this question. What do I follow more faithfully? The traditions of men or the commandments of God? If you find yourself, like I was, as well, following the traditions of men more faithfully than the commandments of God, drop to your face, ask God for forgiveness, and repent while there is still time. Because people, it is short. It is short. This is message is shared with you because, you know, we love you. And everyone deserves to know the truth. God wishes that none will perish. But the Bible says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Just remember, people, this is a, these are believers saying this. Non-believers don't cast out demons in the name of any of Yeshua or Jesus. These are believers pleading with the Lord. Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to those, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness, transgression of the commandments, not living by the commandments. Lawlessness. This is about believers. I just read that part. <laughs> so many believers who are worshiping God, however they feel fit, are going to hear, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't know about you, but I do not want to hear that. This is one of the scariest, if not the most scariest verses to reflect upon in the Bible. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swore to them. And that, my friends, is Deuteronomy 4, 4 verses 30 to 31. When it comes... In the latter days, and you turn to him and repent and obey, he's not going to forsake you. God knows a true repentant heart. He knows true repentance. And I pray that this blesses somebody. Someone needed to hear this. Maybe these verses that you've seen before, you see them in a new light. All praise to the Most High. Praise to Yah. God bless you all. Have a good night, good day, bye.